Welcome to episode 12 of Bridge Talks Business with Milford. This week, we delve into quarter three earnings reports out of the States. What do they tell us about the health of the world's largest economy as it hurtles towards electing a brand new president? We'll find out, but first, your top five business bits from the past week. Coming in at number one, the Reserve Bank Governor Adrian Orr says interest rates will continue to fall at coming meetings. There was some expectation that the bank may cut by three quarters of a percent, but it's much more likely to be in the range of half a percent delivered. Global purchasing manager business surveys were little changed from the previous month, but they confirmed the trend of weaker manufacturing but stronger services industries. Geographically, the US stands out as a strong economy compared to other developed countries. At number three, US bond yields continued their surge last week as investors continued to turn more optimistic on the trajectory of economic growth, but also wary of inflation rearing its head again. Number four, this week we have a busy period of potentially market-moving news, including a raft of economic data and the latest companies, the biggest ones in the world, reporting their results. But the event consuming all the oxygen in the room is undoubtedly going to be the US election, which happens next week, with the markets picking Donald Trump will take the White House. Welcome to our feature interview this week. It is great to have you here. We're going to look at quarter three earnings season out of the United States, obviously the world's largest economy, but also has some of the world's largest companies. So how are they faring? Just to note, this segment is informational only and should not be considered financial advice. I'm delighted to have back on the podcast today, Stephanie Batchelor, a senior analyst at Milford. G'day. Hello. Good, good to have you back. Good to be back, Ryan. So let's talk about, last time we spoke about earnings reports, we looked at what the banks are saying about the health of the economy. What have they said this this time around? Yeah, so they provide a pretty good read-through of the broader economy. And all the US banks delivered very strong results. Um, in particular, they said they saw a lot of positives in the capital markets. Um, so Morgan Stanley said they're in the early stages of what they see as a multi-year recovery in capital markets. And essentially, that's corporates are feeling more confident to embark on mergers and acquisitions, raise equity, um, and all of that drives those big bank investment fees. Um, the other thing they said was around the US consumer, still quite resilient. They're seeing solid spending patterns. They did say that the lower income consumer is still quite stretched. So that's where they're seeing higher delinquencies, lower deposits, and higher credit card balances. Um, they did say, though, that you know easing inflation and rates coming down will benefit that cohort. Right. So the capital markets thing's interesting, isn't it? That's, they're basically saying they're a bit more confident, yeah. they're willing to go up and uh, go out and buy up other companies and expand, things like that. Yeah, they're happy to take on some more of that risk. Okay. What about housing? Because that's another big one when we talk about the states. It's been, you know, struggling a little bit. What are the, the companies involved with either construction or whatever? What are they saying about the housing market? Yeah, so one US home builder reported, um, Pulte, and it was a disappointing result. So they said that affordability for first home buyers is still really tough. And then for other buyers, um, this election overhang is having a bit of an impact because often people don't want to make big life decisions, big financial decisions when there's political uncertainty. Um, they did say, though, that when interest rates started to come down, they did see a pickup in demand. So it might just be a place that we have to be a bit more patient with. Okay, interesting. What about, you mentioned the um, lower income consumers. What about the other end of the market, the luxury brands? Because mm -hmm. you would think that even though there's a you know recession on, even though things are tough, that people have got lots of money are still out there spending, are they? Yeah, so this is an interesting one. The luxury goods companies do have a higher income consumer and they have generally held up better. But the issue for the luxury goods companies over the last year has been China, um, a very weak housing market, consumer sentiment very low. And so the Chinese people are just not traveling or spending as much as they historically would have. Um, so if we look at Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy or LVMH, that's the largest luxury goods company in the world. Um, and it's sort of considered a bit of a bellwether for the space. Uh, they had their, their share price fell 30% between March and September. Wow. And then in September, they announced the Chinese stimulus. So the market got excited thinking, okay, Chinese demand is going to be reignited. Um, the share price moved up 20% in just one week. Uh, and then, of course, after that, 
more questions started coming. You know, how long is the stimulus going to take to flow through? What form is it going to take? And so the stock started to fade because those answers are not yet available. Mm. It's interesting because it, it, someone was saying that their demand at the moment in China for luxury goods is, is, is as bad as it was during COVID. Yeah, so LVMH reported their financial result uh, about two weeks ago and it was – Quite disappointing. So their key segment, fashion and leather goods, mm. revenue fell 5%. Now, this is the first quarterly decline since in that segment since 2009, if we exclude COVID. Wow. Um, and management said that consumer sentiment today in China is back to the all-time lows that they saw during COVID. So that, that Chinese cohort has gone from sort of a mid to high single digit um, growth in, in China for LVMH. To this quarter, it was negative mid-single digit. So there is a big deterioration. They also said that other nationalities were weak. And even though they do believe in that longer term structural growth of luxury, there's just no kind of near term inflection for investors to hang their hats on. So okay. shares were down 4% and pulled some of the other luxury names along with it. Goodness me. All right, let's talk about technology because the best story of the week, I think, was the the fact that the NVIDIA, the AI, you know, chip company overtook, was it Microsoft? Overtook Apple and Microsoft to become the large or the, the most valuable company in the world last week. I think it's might have nudged back a little bit since then. But what's going on in this space? Yeah, so this is a really interesting space, the semiconductor tech space. Um, we had ASML. This is a company that provides equipment to the big semiconductor manufacturing companies. They um, actually had quite a negative result. They they lowered their, their expectations for next year's earnings. And because of that, the market got a bit worried. They thought, you know, is this the end of the AI boom or is AI starting to fizzle out? A few days later, another company called TSMC, this is a the largest semiconductor manufacturing company in the world, and it's actually one of ASML's customers, they reported a record third quarter um, and it completely eased fears that the AI boom is, you know, it effectively said the AI boom is alive and well. And that, of course, then boosted NVIDIA to all-time highs. So there's a lot going on in the space, um, but it's very interesting. So it's quite funny, not not, a, not just with the technology one you mentioned, but with the luxury goods, mm. that one company's value and, and earnings reports can really affect other ones in the same market. Absolutely, yeah. And so, for example, with luxury, you know, it, it pulled some of the other luxury names down, but then those luxury companies reported. And it was quite mixed. So we had Kering, which owns the Gucci brand. Um, they reported, they had their third profit downgrade um, or profit warning in a row. And they said Gucci revenue is down 25%, um, which is pretty negative. Wow. And it's all because of China. Yeah. Um, but then Hermes, which is another luxury company, reported revenue up 11%. Um, they're still seeing a slowing in China, but to a much lesser extent. Um, they target a much higher income consumer. They actually have waiting lists for their most popular bags. So that gives them very strong pricing power. Um, there's also been some studies that show if you held a Hermes Birkin bag over the long term, the annual return from that would outpace the S&P 500. So people sort of see these bags as investments. <laughs> All right. So what else have we learned from um, reporting season from the, the third quarter? Yeah. So if we go down the expensiveness spectrum a little bit, um, we can think of like uh, athleisure, Nike, Adidas, two brands that everyone knows very well, but very different fortunes at the moment. Nike's been struggling. Um, they pulled back from selling their goods through uh, retail partners. And so that left a lot of shelf space that competitors were then able to fill. Nike also hasn't been innovating as much. So they actually withdrew their guidance and they postponed their investor day, um, partly because they now have a new CEO as of two weeks ago. So they're giving him time to get up to speed, um, implement a turnaround strategy, but it is one that you have to have patience for. Uh, then if you think of Adidas, um, very different. So they have very strong brand heat. They did a, uh, announced a beat and raise for the third time in a row. Um, and they're being a lot more innovative. They're seeing very popular um, demand for their popular sneakers like the Samba and the Spezial and, and things like that. So two similar companies, very different kind of outcomes. So can you postpone your investor day? Is that hard to do? Is that a 
I think it's bad. It's just, yeah. So it is taken badly because yeah. people look forward to these invest days as events where you get a, a, a good amount of information. You get to see what the company is thinking going forward. But of course, with a new CEO, it's very difficult for him to come into the company and all of a sudden be able to provide his view after two weeks. So yeah. it does make sense. Um, but yeah, it's it's patience is required. Yeah. Stephanie, my two favorite companies, Netflix and Tesla. You can't go past the Netflix or Tesla story without reading it. So they've both reported now. Let's start with Netflix. How are they doing? They actually reported their most profitable quarter ever. Now, despite subscriber growth slowing, and it's slowing because they've gone through a period where they've cracked down on password sharing. So all those people who were sharing passwords have had to sign up as new customers. So they had very strong subs subscriber growth. That's now starting to fade, but they have other growth drivers that are taking its place. So one of them is their ad-supported membership model, where people pay a little bit more to have no ads and a little bit less if you're happy to have some ads. So they not only get more revenue from the memberships, but they also get that advertising revenue as well. So a very strong result for Netflix. And very smart move too. You're diversifying your revenue streams at exactly. the same time, right? What about Tesla? Tesla sort of surprised everyone. Yeah, it was a blowout quarter. Um, shares were actually up 22%, which was a, a huge move. And it was for a few things. Um, they had a very strong result in their in their energy storage business. Um, their Cybertruck turned a profit for the first time ever. And then, of course, Elon Musk gave some very optimistic targets for next year. He said there's going to be some new models coming out, some more affordable models coming out in the first half of 25. Um, and they plan to roll out autonomous ride hailing in Texas and California next year, subject to regulatory approval. Right. It's interesting because China's obviously subsidizing, massively subsidizing electric vehicles. So that's kind of a threat to, to Elon Musk and to Tesla, right? But when he comes out and says stuff like that, we've got these big plans of it, do the, do the markets listen? Do, do they... They, they do. I mean, um, shares were up 22% on the day, so people did get excited. It's interesting how it impacts other companies as well, because on that, that day that Tesla went up and they announced their autonomous ride hailing and they gave some information around their cyber cab as well, Uber and Lyft sold off. Because, of course, if that comes to fruition, that's more competition for those companies. So it's an interesting dynamic going on. Yeah. Let's talk about then the future. So we've obviously had the results now. What are we? What are the, these companies that have reported thus far um, expecting about the future? And what about the ones who haven't reported yet? Yeah. So overall, if we think about the third quarter earnings, um, it's it's not a great quarter. So growth has decelerated from the second quarter to the third quarter. But investors understand that, and expectations have come down. What investors are really focused on is the outlook. What are companies saying about the future prospects, particularly because we're now in a rate cutting cycle. Um, so, so that's that's sort of. What the focus is, we've got the biggest week of earnings season this week. So that's when we have a lot of the MAG7. We've got um, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Meta, and Google all reporting this week. So there's a lot of focus on that. It's, uh, it'll be a big week for markets. Mm, certainly will. Um, thank you very much, Stephanie. Great to have you back on the podcast. Thanks, Ryan. It's Stephanie Batchelor, a senior analyst at Milford. Don't forget, you can like, subscribe, watch us, listen to us wherever you like. We'll be back next week with by then we should have yes we will have an election result hmm we may have an election result by next <laughs> week's podcast we'll find out see you then